live from Houston, Texas, it's theCUBE. Covering Grace Hopper's celebration of women in computing. Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of the Grace Hopper Conference in Houston, Texas. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight. I'm joined by my co-host, Karis Hustad. She is a reporter at Chicago Inno and also one of our Ground Truth reporting fellows. Our guest today is Nisha Dua. She is the founder of Built by Girls and also the head of the BBG Ventures uh, Venture Fund, which is part of AOL. Yeah. Hi, thanks, thanks for having me, thanks guys. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for being on. So, um, I want to talk a bit about BBG Ventures mm -hmm. first. So, you're a venture firm that invests in startups with at least one female founder. Yep. Tell us about why that is. That's right. Uh, so, we launched about two years ago out of AOL, um, really with this thesis that women are the dominant consumer. So, if you look across um, the internet, social platforms, uh, we make 85% of purchasing decisions, um, and we're really, you know, all these stats around gaming, the use of the phone, camera, women are the leaders. So I think it makes a lot of sense to be backing founders, particularly in the consumer space, um, who really are the end user. Um, and then I think if you look at the data on the other side, actually what we're seeing is that women drive higher returns. So First Round Capital did a study of over 600 founders in the last 10 years, and they found that companies Companies with at least one female founder drove 63% higher returns. So when you bring that together, you realize actually investing in women in tech is not about doing good, it's actually about making money and that's a really great thing. Yeah, absolutely, but what's so interesting is that less than 10% of venture funding uh, goes to female-run startups. Yeah. Um, so where do you think that breakdown is? Why, yeah. why wouldn't people follow the money? Yeah, well I think um, the majority of VC partners are white males. Or, or Indian men, actually. My, my uh, business partner often, often jokes with me. She says, Nisha, you're more diverse because you're a woman than because you're Indian, <laughs> uh, right? And so people invest in what they know, what they understand, and they invest in people who look like them. And, and looks don't necessarily mean from like a visual perspective, but I went to Stanford, I was an engineer, I worked at this tech company, right? And so there's um, historically been a lack of women that fit that, that profile, that fit the Mark Zuckerberg profile. And I think that's widely acknowledged in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that's one piece of it. And then the other piece is that um, traditional VCs, men, don't have this network of women. So what many male VCs will say is, you know, we'd love to invest in female founders, but there just aren't enough of them. We, we're not seeing them. Um, we know that that's wrong because we've seen over 1,200 companies in the last two years. So they're definitely out there. Um, and then I think women are often solving problems um, that they've experienced. And so it can be harder for a male partner to identify um, with that problem they're solving. We hear a lot of stories from female founders saying, um, this, this investment partner said, let me ask my wife, let me ask my girlfriend, let me ask my daughter, let me ask my assistant. Um, and so there's definitely, I think, a, a, a gap in the understanding of the problems that women are solving. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about some of the companies that you have yeah. invested in, because um, you know, I think that you know, we, yeah, we have the sense that they're, you know, they're not getting enough investment and that um, more women need to start found, ups, or found startups, but you've actually been actively investing in yeah. And so what are, um, tell us about some of the, the most exciting startups that you're working yeah. with right now? So we are invested in 40 companies. I think we have nearly the largest portfolio, fund portfolio of female founders in the country. Um, you know, women are solving a broad range of problems. So they're solving anything from the fashion and beauty space. We're in a company called Glam Squad, which is like the Uber of beauty. They send, um, they send a stylist to your house to do your hair, do your makeup, do your nails. Um, that is, the, the unit economics on that business are really smart, right? Mm -hmm. Like that business works. Um, on the flip side, we were invested in a, a male-female team, both engineers, um, who've built a, a weather app that uses the sensors in your smartphone to give you a more accurate weather prediction. It's called Sunshine. Um, the weather prediction on Sunshine is probably 10 times better than the weather app on your phone. Mm -hmm. um, and what's really interesting about that is, you know, male, female team, um, weather is something we all need. Um, but interestingly, 75% of the users are women. Mm -hmm. And that's because a really great use case for accurate weather prediction is figuring out what to wear in the morning. Mm. Um, so really interesting set of consumer problems all the way to um, 
you know, really technical problems. So we're invested in a company called Uncharted Play, which is using or harnessing the power of kinetic energy um, to create power for uh, third world countries like Nigeria. Um, and they're really figuring out how to reduce the size of that technology to effectively become the intel of energy. So, you know, what is this chip that we can put into everything that moves to harness, you know, you walking or using a stroller and to create energy that way and exchange energy that way. Hmm, absolutely. So yeah, you've been doing this for two years and yeah. it sounds like you've some really fascinating startups. Have you seen that return, you know, as, as we've seen that uh, you know, diverse startups are supposed to you know, give these great returns. How has it been on the financial side? Yeah, I mean, I think from a data perspective, um, you're looking at a relative comparison. So we we don't have those all male teams where we can do that comparison. So that's that's one piece. The second piece is, you know, when you're looking at early stage investing, you know, the oldest company in our portfolio is really probably only three years old. We've only been doing this for two years, right? So it's actually. You, you can't really yet say that you've figured out the financial return. I mean, we could run an IRR calculation and say these companies are performing well. Um, what I do know is that we're measuring success on, and, and this is what you should be doing at the early stage, whether these companies are getting to the next round of funding, right? Okay. It's our job to help them get to their Series A or their Series B. Because you guys are early stage. We're early okay. stage. So I think what we're seeing is, you know, um, over a third of the companies are raising their second round of money or have been successful at raising their second round of money, which is uh, really indicative of the traction that these companies are seeing. Um, you know, we're seeing other signs of success, right? So uh, we have a company called Hop Skip Drive in San Francisco um, that is a ride sharing service for kids. Now, there are lots of ride sharing you know, companies, right? We, yeah. we know we know the big ones. Um, they had a significant competitor in the Bay Area, run by two men. Um, it failed. You know, they mm. raised ten million dollars and they had to shut down. Mm. Um, you know, I think in one sense a sign of success is have these guys been successful in a very difficult market and we're, we're seeing that with some of these women founders precisely because they are building for women so they're the end user so at hop skip drive they've been very thoughtful and very deliberate about the way in which they've rolled out their driving service through different geographies um, they've been really thoughtful about building a sticky product uh, versus spending money on upfront customer acquisition right and those are those are things that are going to that are going to make any startup successful so i think it's it's early days um, but we're seeing a number of companies that are you know 20 of our companies already generate revenue um, in early stage that's like a bit of a myth right so um, you know i think women are also building companies that are real businesses mm -hmm. yeah absolutely so i mean and it's, it's really fascinating to hear you know i mean these are great examples but women still do struggle to get funding yeah. um so you know i'm curious if you've heard from the entrepreneurs that you've worked with um you know are they, are they just coming to you because they know like they don't have to deal with the usual obstacles to getting funding like i'm curious about um you know kind of the pipeline that you're creating as um, a woman in venture capital yeah. and specifically reaching out to women entrepreneurs yeah i mean i think we definitely get a lot of outreach from from women who've had trouble finding funding. Um, I would say that's not necessarily the reason they come to us. I think they come to us for two reasons. Um, one is because they want to have women at the table. So they may have a set of other founders, but having a board or a set of investors who don't look like you and maybe don't understand your problem is, is less appealing than having someone at the table who does. So I think that's one reason. And the fact that we put a stake in the ground on that means that we're highly approachable. Um, I think the second reason actually is that our backgrounds are as operators and running businesses and we're obsessed consumers. So my partner, Susan Line, um, was the CEO of Gilt, was the CEO of Martha Stewart, ran ABC Entertainment, um, you know, greenlit some shows that you're very familiar with that are still on TV today. And so she brings a wealth of operating experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I ran a website at AOL. We, we're active participants once we invest to the extent that the company needs us. Um, and then we bring the backing of AOL and now Verizon because Verizon acquired AOL, um, which means we have, a, we have a network that we can tap into. And, 
And when the biggest challenge for a startup is traction and scale, that's actually a really valuable asset. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no question that women are still having trouble raising. Um, you know, we have a company, one of our best performing companies, um, they recently raised their Series A. It took them a very long time to raise their seed round. Um, and you know, when they when they finally did, they'd been at it for two years, um, but they had incredible metrics. And so, um, you know, a, a male partner led that round because he really understood it. We came in and now they're having no trouble at all. So. You know, I think it's a sad fact that there are some female founders out there with great businesses who maybe have to show a little more to be funded. Um, and I think that's the kind of conversation that we need to change with with more female investors. Yeah. yeah. And I'm curious about the, the companies that they're building as well. Is, I mean, you start with startup and your goal is to scale. Um, yeah. Are they thinking about diversity as they scale? And is that something that you kind of recommend or you know help um, startups think yeah. about as they grow? So look, there's no question that the data says diverse teams perform better. And that's diversity across gender, across race, yeah. multiple viewpoints, um, improved performance. So, you know, I think what's interesting about women is they don't really need to think about that. They're always thinking about that. I think it's companies that are all men that need to think about it. So overwhelmingly, in our startups, I actually think you see a very diverse set. There, there are a few companies that are all women. Um, you know, we're investors in a company called The Wing, which just launched, which is actually um, a co-working networking space for women only, like a Soho house for women. Um, so I think that's one of the exceptions to the rules. I think broadly speaking, women inherently um, identify with differing viewpoints. Um, but, I, but I think, you know, racial diversity is a really important thing. You have to think about where is that pipeline that, that, that you're going to, to recruit. And Grace Hopper is a really great example of that. Um, the diversity in the room here, I think I was saying to you, I've never been in a room with so many women in technology, um, but also such a diverse set. And I think that's what we're seeing with organizations that are thinking about the early pipeline, like a Girls Who Code, for example, Black Girls Code. Um, that is really helping the, the pipeline of diverse talent come up in the ranks. Um, but I do think if you're a male run company, you need to be actively thinking about that. Yeah, yeah, right. And I want to talk about the pipeline a little bit too, because yeah. Built by Girls, which was kind of the uh, organization that inspired BBG Ventures, mm -hmm. um, that's all about um, having helping girls think about tech in like every part of their lives. Yeah. So um, tell us a little bit of how you're addressing like that side of the pipeline problem. So I guess you eventually will have more <laughs> female run startups. Yeah, I in. mean, they're the next generation of female founders, right? And so, you know, one of the ways we think about it is start with the 16 year old girl. Start with the girl who is not quite sure what she wants to do. I was, you know, we call them digital natives. They're all using Snapchat. Yeah. Snapchat's behind us today. Um, but do they know how it's built? And are they really thinking about how technology can accelerate their career, whether they end up on the business side or the marketing side, or whether they're the technology driving the company? And so we, we are really running a series of programs, internships, competitions, meetups that are aimed at exposing girls to the variety of career options, whether you're a product manager, whether you're an engineer, um, and connecting it, them in with those mentors. So I think part of the pipeline problem for us is how do we build this new club? So if there's an old boys club today in technology, how do we dismantle that a little bit, shake it up, and not build a women's only club, but build a club that is built from the ground up where men and women are interacting equally. And I think the way to do that is to start with young women and connect young women into these professionals in technology at a very early stage, help them build those networks early. Yeah. Nisha, we're just about out of time, but I just wanted to get your last piece of advice yeah. for that female entrepreneur who's out there working away in her basement or her garage yeah. and, and is, is, is thinking about the next step, what would you say to that woman? Um, talk to as many people as possible in your industry. So it's really easy to want to find someone and just ask them to give you money. Your first conversation should never be a pitch for money. You should always be uh, talking to people, sharing your expertise, building meaningful relationships, and ultimately those relationships will introduce you to the person who is ready to give you money. Great advice. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much you. to our guest, Thanks for Nisha having me. Dua, mm -hmm. and, and our co-host, Kara Sustad. Thanks. I'm Rebecca Knight, co-host for theCUBE, and we'll be back with our live coverage of the Grace Hopper Conference in Houston, Texas, after this short break. <laughs>